Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl, Jessie Mae Beluso. I missed you. Did you miss me last week? We took a little break and we're back. So good to be here. Thank you so much for being here yourself. Can't do this podcast without you, literally. So thank you to the thousands of people who are listening. I appreciate you. If you wouldn't mind rating and reviewing the podcast. Go right over to the Apple app, leave us a little rate and review, let us know your favorite parts of the podcast, favorite guests, and anything you'd like to see up and coming. You can email us as well at jessiemaypelusocomedy at gmail.com. And the video for this podcast will be available on our Patreon, as well as other fun stuff will be posted on the Patreon as well. That's patreon.com forward slash jessiemaypeluso. This episode, I am very, very excited about. I was on the Adam Carolla podcast for a couple guest episodes last week, and I met this fella on one of those episodes. He is the co-founder of TrueMed. It's a company that enables Americans to buy exercise and healthy food with FSA and SHA dollars. He's also the co-author with his sister, Dr. Casey Means, of an upcoming book on food as medicine, which you guys know is right up my alley. We talk a lot about health and wellness on this podcast now that once started with conversations with my dad (laughs) has evolved into more conversations about how the death of my father has propelled me into an eternal search for optimum health. This gentleman was also a consultant for food and pharma companies and is now exposing practices they use to weaponize our institutions of trust. He's a graduate of Stanford and Harvard, Harvard Business School. And all around, just a very interesting conversation about health and about food and the lies that we've been told and ways that we can, with relatively cheap means, improve our lives. It is not that far off and not that far-fetched of an idea for you guys to have a life that is filled with health and wellness and to feel alive and to not succumb to disease so often like so many of us do. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Sharp Tongue Podcast with Mr. Kaylee Means. Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, beep. Beep, 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 You're beep. listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie. Peluso. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary, a deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's going to get dirty. You might cry. You probably laugh. Hopefully you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss, comedy how hard it is to make it in this biz i'm a fucking professional each week it's something different sometimes i have a guest host sometimes it's gonna be a movie companion episode sometimes i just ramble about the bullshit i dealt with the week before you never know what you're gonna get it's raw uncut and funny it's me god your podcasts are so good (laughs) oh thank you i appreciate that i um oh my gosh i'm so i'm on like this the same such such a same journey and just like you're just so powerful Thank you. Um, that means a lot. I, uh, yeah. I've wanted to get into an area of use and, and usefulness for people. And obviously the easiest move is to go into something that interests you and health has prepared. You know, my totally. life has propelled me into being interested in health and getting healthier. We both have a similar story where our parents sort of created a pivot for us in our lives as far as what they went through and where it propelled us. And I want to get into that. But before we get into it now, there's an intro. Everyone knows who you are for the most part um, based off of the intro. But you sent me an email that was so detailed and mm. amazing. I It's one of the reasons why I prefer to interview and speak with professionals because you're so organized. But you said something that really was the what main reason I wanted to talk to you besides us meeting on Corolla and me being completely enthralled by your area of expertise and what you're doing. You said, I'm convinced the healthcare system is systematically trying to gaslight us from having curiosity about the interconnectivity of our mm-hmm. body. And for some reason, when we say that and when people hear it, it's the fringe. We're on the fringe. Mm-hmm. And I would love to start this conversation by asking you what propelled you into this area? 
Yeah, I was like the least fringe person. I identified as a very non-fringe person. I grew up very conservative in Washington, D.C., worked in conservative politics and, you know, was very vocal about the great innovations of American pharmaceuticals and the American food system. You know, I worked in politics and then consulted for these food and pharma companies. So so this has been a long, long journey for me. And you know, listening to your podcast and meeting people along this journey, I think there's people from so many backgrounds uh, waking up, you know, and for me, for me, it was very personal. Um, You know, my, uh, my best friend was my mom. And, uh, and in her, you know, final years, um, she, you know, was diagnosed with prediabetes, like 50% of Americans, and got really into the, you know, root cause of what was causing that. And her her house was just stacked with, you know, some some authors you, you mentioned, but Mark Hyman and other authors, you know, these folks just talking about the root cause of disease. And then my sister was the pride of the family. She was a Stanford med school, top of her class, president of her Stanford undergrad class. She was much more impressive than me. And she was she was a surgeon. And around the same time my mom got prediabetes, my sister just threw up her hands and said she had this out of body experience where she was operating on someone. And the person was passed out beneath her had, um, she was a head and neck surgeon. So they, she had, uh, the patient had sinusitis, um, inflammation of the sinuses. And my sister, Casey had no idea why that uh, patient passed out below her was even sick. Um, and she realized that at Stanford med school, they didn't teach one class on nutrition. And she went down this rabbit hole, reading Mark Hyman, reading a lot of these other folks, the podcasters talking about these things. And so she's like, I'm l- learning more from podcasts than I did at Stanford medical school about why people actually get sick. And then tracing that, you know, pharma somehow pays for more than 50% of all medical school funding through the research or other grants. And you really, and, and, and she realized that, you know, the vast majority of her medical school curriculum was pharmacology. Um, you know, then that brings us to our mom. You know, you've talked a lot about Alzheimer's. My mom um, was abruptly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and cancer literally feeds on glucose, um, and, you know, coming from our diet. And you tie the metabolic impacts, the impacts of food to the increases of cancer. You know, we all know diabetes, heart disease is tied to food. Cancer is highly tied to food. Um, so, you know, that indelible image of my mom in her final days um, is not one of actual sadness for me. Um, uh, my mom was on that journey of having awe for the, you know, connections between the body. She reading all these books. I, I think really going on this, this path of just curiosity, as I said, and that actually had a huge impact on her life. The cancer got her, but that that impacted my sister and I. So my sister's speaking out about this. I'm I'm coming from it, not from the medical perspective, but from my experience of seeing, seeing really, I think systematically, these companies trying to decrease our curiosity. Um, and just to just to tie it all back, you know, again, I come from kind of the political background. Um, if you just you think about Coke, what we should be doing. Right? Yeah, I worked for Coke and 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 worked for uh worked for some of the pharma companies. But but originally in it cuz I wanted to, you know, improve America and and I just think um you know, when you think about in this again, you say this sounds kind of fringe, but but if you just take first principles, what should we be doing as a society for humans? We should be thinking about our brains and our bodies. And you know, the the fact of the matter is that you know, 25% of kids having prediabetes, 50% of adults having prediabetes or diabetes, that's literally like cellular dysfunction, like 20% of our cells are in our brain. So like, if we've got mass cellular dysfunction happening among Americans, um, and, and that's predominantly actually happening in our brains, it's like that's shrouding how we view the world. And, um, and obviously these like these these miracle cures aren't working. So so from a public policy standpoint, like like if we're just just creating healthcare policy for this country, the first principle has to be how do we how do we spur everyone on that journey of understanding the connections um, between things, um, not 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 just lunging for these miracle cures. Um, that, so so that's that's something I've become very passionate about and I'm speaking out on. And I think curiosity is a, an important word because. It requires a level of will and a level of responsibility on the individual. And I do think that there is a crossroads in this issue where the responsibility is almost divided. The responsibility is divided between the individual and the involvement, over-involvement, under-involvement of our government within our healthcare system. And it's important to be curious and I I often wonder because I've had this conversation with different people and a similar 
question or comment comes up, people should know how to eat well. And Mm -hmm. you can lead a horse to water, but it's going to want to drink soda. So what do you say to that? What do you say to that sort of crossroads where while an individual should be given access to resources and be told proper information and given proper information by the government. And what do you say to people who should take it upon themselves to be proactive uh, with their health? Where, where do you, where, where does your um, opinion lie within those two worlds between the will of the individual think, and the, the responsibility of the government. So I'm a, I'm a libertarian free choice guy, but I've really turned on this because I don't think 80% of Americans are trying to be obese and frankly, many kids, right? The parents are, I don't think that's free choice. I don't, I, I don't think we're systematically trying to kill ourselves and frankly, poison our children. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me give a couple examples that have really informed my perspective on this. And it really goes on trying to unpack. I'm really trying to unpack the incentives from my experience. So a couple of just quick anecdotes. So my sister, as she got more nutrition as a surgeon, tried to give a, a woman who had been to, uh, I think it was 17 doctors over the previous year for 17 siloed issues, having migraines, but depression, and she had, you know, a host of other issues, right? Uh, metabolic issues. She suggested a nutrition intervention and her attending surgeon said, don't be a pussy. Uh, their, their slogan was don't be a pussy and nutrition is, is a pussy kind of thing. And that, that was, that was the kind of the culture and that, that I think most doctors would, would agree permeates throughout kind of the medical field. We're here to prescribe drugs and do surgery and nutrition. The doctors haven't learned it. And it's seen as this very niche topic and that's financially driven, right? 95% of all medical spending is on interventions on sick people. So what you have, you know, for medical schools, which need more students and pharmaceutical companies and hospitals, you know, you know, 10% of American GDP flows through a hospital billing system, right? These are big, these are the, this is the highest employing industry in the United States, right? And what's happened is every single institution can tell their lieutenants, their doctors and their drug makers and that they're being brave and helping people. But nobody's actually asking why everyone's getting sick. And that's very convenient. And then when you trace why people are getting sick, um, it's food. Um, and, you know, there, there's there's key elements that have happened. Our food. We spend 50 percent of what European countries do on our diet. It's systematically become you know, cheaper. We have seed oils, which are very inflammatory, added sugar 100x more than we did 100 years ago, you know, on processed grains, which which are really a scandal, which turn into sugar in the bloodstream. That's the basis of our diet. It's all new in the past 100 years. And what's kind of perverse, and what I saw, you know, helping Coca-Cola try to keep food stamp uh, funding, you know, nutritional program, uh, the major- uh, 10%, the number one item is soda for, for kids, a kid's nutrition program. Uh, we were trying to keep that I helped Coke, you know, it's, it's not that complicated. We Coke paid millions of dollars to the American Diabetes Association. We literally paid off the association that credentials diabetes doctors. Now the obesity group, the, the dietary guideline group that is literally credentials dietitians. These were all paid millions of dollars by Coke and other food companies The American Diabetes Association, again, this is the group that credentials diabetes doctors and creates guidelines for the United States, had a Coca-Cola logo on its website until three years ago, uh, endorsing small cans of Cokes, uh, Coke uh, for diabetics. (laughs) So so you you just, you, you have this situation, right? And it's just following the money where a food system, where people want the food to be cheaper and more addictive, and that's very conscious, and then a medical system that should be speaking out about that, but has profited from these interventions. So I think the big crime is that the medical system, who we would trust to speak out about this, has just been silent. So, so you really can just chase the incentives. And to just answer your question, I think empowerment involves waking up and understanding that. But there are trillions of dollars of interest that, you know, again, I, I think it's kind of empowering to, to embrace this as a baseline. We're not crazy for all being unhealthy. Like, like there are big incentives against us right now that we should realize. You did talk a lot about incentives on the Adam Carolla podcast. And I often, when I'm having these conversations, maybe appear fringe, but I'm glad to know, you know, there is a community <laughs> of people that are starting to wake up to the reality of what's going on. And I always ask when somebody goes, well, there was uh, you know, a study done 
My first question is who paid for the study? If there's a study, all studies in my experience, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professional. I just read and I'm, I'm curious. All the studies I have read usually go to prove how something doesn't like why something isn't working. Very rarely does it go towards looking for a cause. It creates a problem to then justify there being a, a pharmaceutical on the back end of it. Yeah. And I also, I don't like the word cure. I think the word cure mm -hmm. is dangerous in our culture, in our, in our healthcare system, because it relies upon an issue and a problem to exist. And I think that that is the root for a lot of the pharmaceutical companies to make money. If there's a cure, they can stay in business. If there's prevention, which is what we're talking about, they're going to go out of business. But prevention is reliant upon people being informed. And, you know, we, we also spoke, the other thing we spoke briefly about, which I wanted to talk about on this podcast was that article I mentioned, I think it was in New York Times. I'll put it in the show notes along with all this mm -hmm. information about uh, Cali and true medicine and, and everything else. We talked about Rockefeller and Carnegie's involvement in the, the basic implementation of pharmaceuticals into the healthcare system and sort of booting out the nutritional aspect and the more homeopathic approach. And it's evident in, in today's offices, when you go into a doctor's office, you're being prescribed medication. You're not being told or asked about your nutrition. Um, I bring this up because both of our mothers were sick. My mother was sick. She had heart issues. She had a conge congestive heart failure towards the end, but she had a stent put in. And when she went to her mm -hmm. cardiologist, her cardiologist didn't ask her anything about her diet, about her exercise, about her yeah. health. Only asked about the symptoms. Only asked about what he could prescribe medication for. Now, my question is, in your experience with embarking in this world of breaking down the system how how do we how do we fix that like where what is a yeah. solution you see to to that problem where doctors are refusing to acknowledge general health like how can people feel confident right. about going into a doctor's office I think it's understanding. So, 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 and take it, you know, from a guy that saw a bunch of other white guys wrecking the system. I mean, <laughs> working for Coke, working for, that's my expertise. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe it's not surprising, but it's true. So working for Coke, okay. Sitting in a public relations office in Washington, DC, we allocated tens of millions of dollars to nutrition research and Coke did not care what the nutrition research said. The literal whole point of the tens of millions of dollars of funding was to have contradictory information about nutrition. So there'd be a new news article saying, you know, it's this or it's salt or it's that. That is the point. Like, like this is not complicated. Like, like, like this is actually very basic, right? If you can fund a bunch of studies, there's going to be more news articles and there's going to be more debate from the media that wants to have controversy and debate and people are going to be more confused. I think one of the primary things and going to the incidents you talked about a hundred years ago of how our, our, our you know, foundation of medicine was constructed. And, and I, and I think, you know, folks like you and me and, and other folks that don't have medical backgrounds, we have been gaslighted not to ask questions. We have been gaslighted to live in fear. And I think something we need to embrace and something we need to be comfortable with is that it might be a little bit more simple than we're led to believe. Um, what happened with Rockefeller is that he, the byproducts of the oil that he had, he wanted to get into pharmaceuticals and he really pioneered the modern pharmaceutical system and looking for chronic cures. And in order for that to happen, we needed to name diseases. We needed to identify and name diseases. But think about this today. So a doctor, like my, my sister goes to Stanford Med School. She has to choose at the end of graduation, one of 42 specialties. Okay, so we have divided the body into 42 parts. She did head and neck surgery, and then you choose a subspecialty. And she was actually on a track to devote her entire career, her entire life to one millimeter of the body, like in the face, like, like, like literally. The dean of Stanford Med School for her was a head and neck surgeon who had a part of the body and a disease named after him that was even smaller part of the body. He literally, the dean of Stanford Med School, if you really, if you really focus 
hard enough, was like less than a millimeter of the human body. So we're we're chopping the body, right? And naming these conditions. And I would just ask, like, like that is it, that is a result of, of incentives. Like we want to name diabetes, right? And we see that in a silo and we spend over a trillion dollars a year in the United States to manage diabetes. What is diabetes? It's literally cellular dysfunction. Diabetes is our cells malfunctioning. It is the root of most other conditions. It now Alzheimer's uh, research is showing, they're calling it type three diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to find an Alzheimer's patient that doesn't have some dysregulation going on with their cells, either pre-diabetes or diabetes. As you said, often, you know, other comorbidities. These things don't happen in silos. 99% of people with diabetes have at least one other condition. So the fact that we've like chopped it up and like there's a pill for diabetes, metformin, there's a pill for heart uh, to prevent heart disease, statins, depression, which I think is actually highly rated, SSRIs. We've got these pills for everything, but every single condition has been going up. So like we've been lowering our glucose, lowering these little biomarkers, but everyone's getting sicker. Um, that's been very profitable. Um, but, you know, I'm worried, right? I, I, these two big monumental struggles we have looking forward all, are Alzheimer's and obesity. And we're trying to really segment those. And we're spending billions and billions and billions on, on drugs. Um, and now it's recommended that every obese or overweight teenager gets a, gets a pharmaceutical. My worry is, oh again, gosh. this is systematically, yeah, 40%. It's systematically and very much by design trying to make us less curious about why everyone's getting obese or why we're going to drop the early onset Alzheimer's label because so many younger people are getting old. Like, why are all these things happening? When we just like, oh, 40% of kids should have an injection for life on obesity, we're good. That just erodes curiosity, which is going to fail to get us to the problem. Um, and and that's, that's by design. It is pretty wild. The whole Alzheimer's of it all. That was the one thing that I discovered as well. You know, they call it type three diabetes and people who have type one diabetes are like 95% more likely to develop Alzheimer's. There's a direct correlation. And I guess my question for you, and I'm thinking, I know the culprit, but what do you think mm -hmm. if you had to pick a divisive item that is the biggest threat to the American individual, would it be sugar? <laughs> mm -hmm. Would you consider sugar one of the biggest threats to our health? Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so obviously it's there's like a, a systematic holy... issue uh, surrounding it. You know, we're talking about the, a company as big as Coca-Cola having all that influence and people being in bed with each other. And, and, you know, there's so much political involvement, but when you strip it away, there's, it's the cocaine, it's the fucking uh, yeah. drug. Sugar is a huge one. And let, let's get into that. But I actually, you know, listening to your last podcast about just the holistic checklist of, you know, living a more empowered life. I actually like, will go even a step further. Like, I, I, I think like, again, if, if you're looking at it from a public policy standpoint on what we should be using the $4 trillion of healthcare spending to incentivize, I, I really think the above sugar is just like awe and curiosity as we talked about. It's mm, like, yeah. we have cells, we have cells and, and these cells, you know, literally feed like the fuel for those cells of the food we eat <laughs> and movement helps those cells and chronic stress management um, and habits around uh, mindfulness and, and stress, you know, help those cells. We're in, a, we're in a state of constant stress. We're in a state of constantly running from the tiger right now, you know, with our phones and, and modern life, right? And, you know, really managing our mind, sleep. I mean, these, these basic things. And I think the more, you know, we are gaslighted that there's like hacks or we're gaslighted to not be curious about what we're eating, like that leads to cellular damage, which is the underpinning, like, like organ dysfunction is disease. Organs are made of cells, you know, cellular dysfunction leads to organ dysfunction which leads to disease. It's like, it's, it's actually like, it's, it's not that complicated. Like you read a book by Mark Hyman or listen, I, I know you mentioned, I think human in the past, listen to some of these podcasts. It's like, you really, I don't have the answers. We're never going to have the full, but like this path of curiosity about like what our cells need to thrive 
should be like, like every American should be learning about that and empowered to do that. Like we should be as a matter of public policy, like incentivizing like children to sleep, like as their brains are developing, like we should be incentivizing like movement. We keep kids in classrooms with no sunlight, you know, sitting at a desk for eight hours. Like it, it, it's kind of like basic things, but like, 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 so sugar is a big part of that. Right. And, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit in Corolla, but like, sugar what it does to the brain you take a brain scan it is like firing dopamine like 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 oh yeah like you know there's this very interesting book by the head of um psychology at, at columbia university called drug use for grown-ups i don't know if you've come across that i uh, i've heard book. of this book from rogan yeah he's talked a lot about yeah. it and um and uh, it actually, so he was hired by the government. It was a, he was born in the inner city and a, a big anti-drug advocate, this professor. And he was actually hired to do these studies for the government on uh, heroin and cocaine saying that they're bad. And uh, he was very biased towards those drugs being bad. And as he was digging into the government funded research on these drugs, he's like, the, the, this really like isn't as bad as alcohol or, or you know, getting into sugar a little bit more we're eating. It's like, 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 sugar is highly addictive and it's highly like sugar is literally like the cell the uh, fuel for our cells it's it's, it's glucose right we're doing a hundred times more of it than a hundred years ago it's like it's like obvious it's like a car we put a hundred times more gas in it than it's supposed to it's like it's obviously causing mass dysfunction it's highly addictive so yeah i mean i think these things that have become normalized right these things that we label as progress it's very dispiriting to see how normalized it is kids at a birthday party running around like a bunch of meth addicts. So, you know, I think that's one of the dangers. And one of the, one of the reasons I think this is kind of holistic about why every person should be on a journey to kind of wake up. And I know a lot of your listeners are, and certainly a path I'm on. It's like some of the things that are just so normalized, like doctor smoking in every doctor's office in the 1960s, it doesn't mean we don't have a massive blind spot. I think we have a massive blind spot on food, I think we have a massive blind spot on how we think about mental health and how drugs uh, and substances and modalities that increase awe, like psychedelics, are somehow stigmatized, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, we've got like just just you know I think mass um, blind spots that you know children aren't learning how to manage and regulate their brains and meditate <laughs> in school. Like like what would be more important than that? So it's, so the fact that things are normalized, I don't think means we have massive blind spots. And um, I think we really do here. And it, and it is it is dispiriting. I mean, it is dispiriting when you look at all the money going into Alzheimer's and obesity research. Um, or, or the mass majority of it is like little Band-Aid fixes, not really understanding what truly is going on. Uh, but I am encouraged by, I mean, I think these conversations are happening on podcasts from Rogan and you on down. It's like just, 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 just a bottoms up revolution, really. I think so too. And it is... Uh you know, such an interesting point that you said, and I actually was speaking to it, uh, speaking about it to my cousin, her and I have these health conversations all the time. Every morning we're like evolving. Mm -hmm. And what did you read this article and what's the latest, but to go back on what you mentioned, our bodies being pretty much systematically chopped into all of these specialties. And if you look at a society in general, unity is a powerful thing. And when you break down society, when you separate right. people, when you segregate them, that's when you're able to take over. It's the same thing with our bodies. You put them into these little teeny boxes and it's detrimental. The irony of creating all of these specialty little niches is that it is detrimental to our overall health because like you said, it confuses us. It it totally um, convolutes the issue and it, it makes it so that we don't get back to the grassroots of health. I, I, and I'm reminded of this video that was uh, inspirational in my health journey. Just this quick little mm -hmm. clip of Erica Badu. And you, are you familiar with her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she yeah, she's great. she was being interviewed about how does she maintain her health? Because she's just so cool. She's just even keeled, <laughs> chill, it just is, you know, holistic chick. And she says, I visit my doctors. And she's like, Dr. Sun. Dr. Nutrition, mm -hmm. Dr. Sleep, Dr. Exercise, and Dr. Spirit. She has her five doctors and she visits them often. And that's, that is the root of health. And, and you're so right in that we've gotten so far away from that. We've gotten so confused and distracted and, and 
completely separated from our bodies. So that's what these conversations right. are about, right? They're about bringing us back to yeah. our bodies. Um, and look what's, yeah. No, I, I, I was just going to say, you know, it, it's, I think it's important that we're questioning the way things have always been done. And I think that's what's happening is, is we're accepting doctors, we're accepting of the process because it's the way it's always been done. And now it's time for us to sort of wake up and have these conversations. Um, can you, you know, you, you also mentioned in the email, like we're talking about like being empowered as an individual and a patient, what can, what can the person do to empower themselves? Like, what are some basics? Like say, say someone has to go into a checkup, very routine checkup with their doctor, general practitioner, whatever, no real issues. What is a, a, an approach to that conversation with your doctor that you can have to get you on the path of being more informed and to use curiosity yeah. to your benefit. Sure. Here is the framework I use. And I, I think, I think has been very helpful and I think helpful to others. Trust the system for acute issues. Do not trust the system for chronic conditions. So mm. going back to Rockefeller and everything, the medical miracles we can think of that we should be celebrating are almost predominantly for acute conditions, which by that, I mean something that will kill you if it's not solved. So a child having an infection and needing an antibiotic, a inflamed appendix that needs to be taken out, a complicated childbirth, a broken arm, a gunshot wound, like, 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 like these are absolutely like have dramatically improved life. You know, if, if we're, if we're at the end of the line, like really are sick and need like a, like an acute life-saving surgery, all for it. <laughs> okay. If your kid has a broken arm, et cetera, et cetera. So, 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 so if there's an acute issue, we should be trusting and consulting with the medical system. If you're, if your kid has, you know, a crazy fever or something, the problem where we've lost our way, what, what, what Rockefeller saw is that acute conditions don't make money. Mm. And, and what, what the system started doing in the fifties and sixties and the first chronic uh, pill was the birth control pill. And what, 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 what Rockefeller's people and other folks said is, can we create more conditions that are lifetime, you know, that we can treat for, for a long, because there, this is important, right? There was never a long-term pill until the birth control pill. But now today it's more than 90% of medical spending is chronic. We've shifted everything to chronic. There was more antibiotic strains created before 1960 than after. Everyone's given up on acute pills that you know you're cured and you you, you don't you, you don't have to take it anymore. So actually, the Sackler family that led to the opioid crisis and a lot of the Rockefeller people that descended from him in the 60s and 70s, the first blockbuster was called Valium, uh, the first benzos, and actually close to 30 percent of women in the United States in the late 60s and, and, and 1970s were on Valium. There was time covers called saying Valium Nation. And they were pushed like literally in like advertisements saying, are you stressed at home? Is your husband giving you trouble? Like take Valium. It was like, it was like massively like sexist advertising and a conscious coordinated strategy to get women addicted to this. And, and it got up to 30% of US women. But that's that's happening today, those practices. I mean, it, it, it's identifying chronic and segmenting chronic so, so that's what I would say. I would say like, you, you, it is absolute fallacy as a patient sitting in an office to give the medical system the benefit of the doubt. If they're talking to you about obesity, if they're talking to you about getting your cholesterol levels down, you know, it's scary to say to that doctor, hmm, maybe I won't take the statin, but all the empirical evidence shows that he should, unless you're at an imminent risk at an acute issue, really think about it, right? Really think critically, read some books by Mark Hyman, by Rob Lustig, listen to some human podcasts, listen to you talk about this, like collect other information because that drug they're recommending for you is, is superficial. I guarantee it, right? You know, if, if you get your, your cholesterol levels down slightly, that doesn't erase the underlying metabolic dysfunction that what you're eating or maybe your habits are doing. So I think, I think it's having license as a patient to be a little bit more skeptical. And, you know, just one other thing you just hit on as you were talking about about this kind of these questions being asked, right? And, and and this more holistic view on podcasts and things like that. It's like, it actually is crazy when you think about it, right? That last year we had the NIH and leading medical uh, associations in the country coming down on Spotify, literally like, like telling, you know, just the, the highest levels of 
of the medical establishment, right? Uh, deans of med schools begging this company to cancel a podcaster who is encouraging people to take psychedelics, work out and see the sun a little bit more. <laughs> it's you know, that's literally crazy. like, that's literally like, that's literally like he, he's smoking weed and, and talking about getting more sunlight and, and being a more empathetic person and like exercising and maybe questioning some pharmaceutical companies. And that literally, it, it literally, that message was existentially attacked by the leaders of the medical establishment. Like, like have, if you ever, if they ever listened to an, it is literally about personal improvement and like root cause habits and that's labeled as quackery. So you, and, and, and again, this is what I used to do. Like, like that is a dangerous subversive message. Um, you know, looking at the sun and working out um, and thinking about how food might be poisoning us is a very, you know, subversive message. And um, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's worth it to kind of understand that the, that the leaders of our medical establishment were really violently coming down on that message. And I asked you this and I, I want my listeners to hear, you know, I, I don't think I asked you on air with Adam, but mm -hmm. are you at all worried? Are you at all concerned for your own well-being? Do you, do you think these conversations are dangerous to have? Well, I'll, I'll give you a story. Um, I'll, I'll give you a story. So um, I, I my, my partner and I at, at TrueMed have been pushing this Tufts study, um, the Tufts NIH study that says Lucky Charms are uh, three times better healthier than, than beef. Better than beef? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're <laughs> so, so, so a, a study that funded millions of dollars by the government from yeah, um, who, who paid for that fucking study the, the nih the mm -hmm. nih uh and millions of dollars from food companies so of course food companies can jointly fund a government study and we that came out a year ago and my life's mission is to try to educate on incentives right so my partner and i this tweet went viral he wrote a um my, my co-founder of the company wrote a wrote a viral article so fox news started covering it they're the only network that's covering this because because every other network is more than 50 percent of their advertising comes from pharma um joe rogan um did an instagram post about it so the a leading nutritional researcher the, the 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 person who did that study um came down hard on us i mean he reached out um he, you know, cited that we, you know, both went to Stanford and Harvard um, and kind of implicitly implying not to upset the apple cart that we know some of the same people that I'm talking to, uh, cited some mutual acquaintances who are really important to our company, kind of, kind of, kind of playing, you know, let's not upset the, the cocktail party. And then, then he called uh, me from Davos, <laughs> ironically, um, and he spent uh, 20 minutes explaining how immature I was in my nutritional thinking and how Lucky Charms actually are healthy. Um, he said that um, orange juice actually, which is absolutely violent to the cells of children, is is takes all the fiber out from the orange and is 40 grams uh, nu nuclear bomb of sugar to a child's bloodstream. And by all evidence, sugary drinks that are that have no fiber are a disaster. Uh, they were that was rated very highly in the study. He said that should be encouraged for children to drink every single day. I think I, I think it is violent to children to say that they should be drinking forty ounces of liquid sugar every morning. He said that, um, an and he kind of kind of lectured me. Yeah, and um, and um, you know a couple a couple other things such as um, such as that uh, the subsidies the the tens of billions of dollars of subsidies for sugar um, and corn and grains don't really exist. Um, so and, just lying. Um, He's just like yeah, yeah. So, so, lying. so yeah, yeah. And um, and you know, kind of implicit, like, hey, you gotta like play along. You gotta understand that this is complicated. These implicit threats. So this is my framework on it. And yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's already. I mean, again, we're just some dudes tweeting about this stuff and trying to bring attention to it. But I think the way media is working right now, that when Joe Rogan mentioned something or it's mentioned on podcast, it is getting resonance. Um, I think the usual way you play this is you sit at Davos panels, you know, the, you know, the kind of Harvard and elite circles and you kind of, oh, let, let, let's, let's get along to get along. It's, it's okay. Um, I think that's changing. I, I, I think people are opening up and there's independent media. And the way I think about it, my framework is kids. I mean, it sounds trite, but like there's, 
devastation happening to kids. <laughs> like, like I have a new son. Like he's this adorable little guy. I think he's kids adorable. Are like I, I perused your oh. Instagram. Oh my God. He's so cute. You. Your family's adorable. You. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just like, I don't know. It's like, it's like, I'm not going to be, if I, if we're pushed around, I don't know, we, we you know, who, who who's going to speak out. So um, yeah, I mean, I think we're in a new territory here and um, I'm sure we'll get some more pushback, but I think the power of the microphone is, is important. And um and, and the I pushback that means that message, we're yeah. we're talking about something that is threatening. And that's a good thing because it means we're hitting on truth. You know, the, there's that like saying, like, if it bothers you, it means that it's true. So being a parent, you bring me to my next question, because we sort of touch yeah. base on the individual's empowerment and, and what right. an individual can do. Being a parent of a new, uh, beautiful little boy and to all the other parents out there, it can be very right. difficult to navigate health when you're responsible for another human being. It's a little bit easier to be reckless when it's just you, but now you right. have another human being in the mix. And how do parents sift through what's real and, and what isn't, you know, because when you're talking about this, you know, 25% diabetes rate with children, I mean, this is a crisis. Mm -hmm. We're in a, we're in a literal like pandemic of, of health for children. So what do parents do? How do they know it, how to handle it? It, we have been gaslighted to think this is complicated, right? Joe posts this study. It's obviously ridiculous about lucky charms. I get an hour lecture about how nutrition is much more complicated than I could possibly understand. Here's something for every parent to know. Humans are the only animal that have diabetes. Every single animal, right? Every single being on this earth is able to find the right nutrition. Right. We're not seeing <laughs> a tiger eating a bowl of Lucky Charms. Go to the yeah. The, the go, tiger, go to out. Uh, yeah. The only the only animals actually that are having metabolic dysfunction are are animals that humans own are like dogs. But like a tigers, there's not like mass diabetes and, and heart disease among tigers. Like they're they're exercising, they're in the sunlight, they're eating, they they kind of implicitly in their body like know what to eat and know what they should be doing, right? So I think that's the most important thing for parents to understand. It's like, I mean, it's it's simple. Like think about what humans are evolutionally made to do. They're not made to eat processed ingredients. And I do think this is like important. And I, I want to just be very open about this because I think there's a lot of rightful, you know, nobody wants to hurt any feelings and, you know, nobody should be made to feel bad. But like, if we're thinking about the leverage of a society of where we should be focused, we should be focused on the first several years of a child, of a, of a human's development. I mean, their brain is doubling in size. And, you know, as, as you've talked about so much of the trauma and the, you know, uh, just, just our basic makeup is really implanted. And, and, you know, all of us are spending our lives trying to unpack in many ways what happened, um, you know, in the first couple of years of life. And you are putting a child just, 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 I'll just say it, right. But you are putting a child at such an advantage. Um, if they're able to get appropriate amount of sleep, appropriate amount of sunlight, appropriate amount of movement, and not have their cells bombarded in their first couple of years uh, with ingredients. And, and just tactically, it's three ingredients. You are getting 80% of the way there, at least, if you look at your child's labels for three ingredients. Added sugar, we all know, but it is crazy looking at labels of organic child served from Whole Foods, how much added sugar there is. And you know, we this is natural almost a flavors. cliche talk. Okay, natural flavors is a big one. Natural flavors, their microbiome, you know, again, this sounds like fluffy, but it's it's true. Like they're, they're, they're bacteria, which regulates their contentment and most other of their hormones, you know, is being formed. And we're pummeling with the anything you can't pronounce, any type of natural flavors. That is really disrupting the, the very sensitive bacteria that's developing that, that manages their mood, that manages their sleep, that manages those things. So, so anything you can't pronounce, any type of natural flavors, that's out. There's a crazy 60 minutes piece on natural flavors on how um, uh, manufactured they are from a couple of years ago. It's a scandal, but that's I mean, a big I mean, one. Doesn't it include like a thousand different chemicals? Like when they say natural flavors, it's like the profile of what that includes is such a large category of chemicals and none of it is natural. Right. It, it, it's a, it's a, th it's, they're neurotoxic. And again, like, like I've come from a background of really trusting the system, right? 
and you kind of just have trust. I can tell you, like the 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 capture of these regulatory agencies by industry is insane. These are neurotoxic chemicals. The EWG database, you can look at your personal care products and some food, like like what the what some of these dyes and chemicals are in child's food, even like organic good child's food. They're completely banned in Europe for good reason. Um, and it's a completely hands-off relationship with the FDA on these chemicals. So that's a big one. So you said uh, added, but, yeah, so sugar, added sugar. Added sugar. Obviously, a child, you really should be, I think, questioning whether a, a child in the first couple of years should have any. I mean, we are controlling our kids' diet. You know, they're going to go on the world. I'm not going to, like, like put handcuffs on my kid not to eat sugar. I think we need to actually train kids of what drug is, what drugs are, what dopamine is, and have them critical think about that. But for those first time when you're controlling what they they should not have added sugar. Okay. Processed grains, any type of processed grains, any type of enriched flour, enriched wheat, that turns into sugar in the bloodstream. That's a hidden sugar. And it just, a kid just doesn't need to eat that. A kid just, you know, you, you watch most what kids are eating is these little rice puffs and all these, they, they don't need, that's not what people used to eat. And then the last is seed oil. So if you look at any kid's food or any food for us, you're going to see canola oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil. That's the basis of our diet. And even, even folks that go to Erewhon and Whole Foods and you look at the back of the hummus, you're going to often see those ingredients. Those are about 20 times cheaper uh, than like a nice olive oil or nice grass-fed butter or healthier fats. But that has wrecked havoc on our cellular function. And a kid, you really should be going for those healthy and, and, and adults looking for olive oil, looking for avocado oil, uh, looking for grass-fed butter, uh, looking for healthy sources of fats not, or, or animal-based fats if you go that way. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the canola oil, soybean oil, very inflammatory. And if you can cut those three things out of your kid's diet and your diet, you're almost pushed to more of a whole food situation. And then whether you go vegan or whether you go carnivore or wherever and you fall in that, I think the vegans and the carnivores and a lot of the smart people are actually 80% the same because they're talking about getting to natural foods and really like matching. And this is how I think about it. And my, my sister's had a huge impact on me. She's a real thought leader on this space, but it's really matching the contents of that food to what our body needs. Um, and you know, when you're eating this processed stuff, that's the basis of our diet and our kids diet, you know, it's problematic. It's, it's really harmful things to our microbiome and our body. But if you're really like having curiosity about the micronutrients and fiber and other elements of like what's in whole food, um, I don't know. I, I, I just think, and you talked about this in the last episode, it's a route to, I think happiness is like, it's yes. a route to like under, I, I, I think there's something there. It's just like, I'm not, I'm on a journey. I'm like, not good at all. I'm, I'm still addicted to sugar, but it's just like, I do think there's something there just like being curious about what my kid's eating. It's like, it's like happiness for me to kind of try to understand that. It, it's not like I have all the answers, but again, we've just kind of been chipped away at to not ask questions. Yeah. And it's funny you say those three things are three things that I have actively worked to mitigate and to limit from my diet, refined sugar, sugar in general, added sugar, um, enriched wheat, enriched anything. And those seed oils, those seed oils are horrible. Mm -hmm. And I had a, um, a heart specialist on Dr. D Nicola Antonio. And we talked about this and he talked about seed oils and how we've been tricked to think, you know, you see seed oil and you think it's healthy. Canola oil is terrible and soybean oil is terrible. Vegetable oil, all these oils that we've cooked with are carcinogenic. And like you said, inflammatory, which puts our body into set into stress and oxidative stress. And, and instead of your body being able to receive and process uh, bioavailability with nutrients, it's having to fight and, and create cortisol. And then that cortisol goes to right. the system. And it's this whole, the systematic issue within our healthcare system is creating a systematic issue within our bodies. And as you're talking, I'm thinking we are getting newer information, but the information as you get, it doesn't change like for, and that's a good thing. Like, you know, getting sun is good for you. That's not going <sighs> to change. You know, getting sleep is good for you. That's not going to change. The things that keep changing are these studies that are funded to try and keep us distracted and try and keep us confused. 
those are constantly changing and, and evolving to fit whatever fucking narrative that these pharmaceutical companies have. Um, well, it's just, it's just the opportunity cost too. Right. Mm, so like, yeah. so like, and that's where I really have empathy and I've, I've changed on the kind of personal response. Of course it's personal and hope, you know, folks are listening to this podcast. And I mean, I was inspired by y- your last one, as I said, I just like, we all need to take responsibility and be on our own personal journey. Right. But l- let's just take the opportunity cost of um, Alzheimer's, right. Or obesity. Um, and this is very similar what's happening in both, but, but this obesity drug, we're being asked as taxpayers to pay hundreds of billions of dollars for that drug. They are literally like pushing. It is a full court press using tactics. I helped these companies use 10 years ago, but it's like full court press on media. They're paying off every obesity doctor. You know, the panel that's recommending guidelines on the FDA is paid off by the drug makers themselves. It, it, it's crazy when you dig into it. But but what's, what the result that they're going to get is that anyone with, oh, they're actually recommending it for overweight or obesity or overweight. That's 80% of Americans. Okay. So what you're going to have is there's a push for Medicaid and Medicare and insurance coverage, which is going to be hundreds of billions of dollars. And this is the same with obese, uh, Alzheimer's drugs. And there was a big controversy because they were so expensive. And literally, like there was concerns, our budget as a country is going to go bankrupt if these obesity and Alzheimer's drugs are approved. But you just got to step back and ask, what if we took that money and actually asked what's driving this, this massive increase in metabolic dysfunction that's presenting itself in diabetes, Alzheimer's, and obesity? What, 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 what if we shifted the money to actually attacking that? What if we actually had programs for kids to get more movement, to get more sunlight? What if we had you know, a real national effort of regenerative agriculture, you know, to um, make our food more nutritious and, and more subsidized and, 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 and uh, incentivize healthy food. It's just like, that could be, that could be where we go. Like, like there's actually, if you just think about it and we're just like totally divorced from like what's happening right now and looked at the problem and we're like, what should we do? That's obviously what we should do. But going back 100 years, going back to how we've set up the system, going back to how we've segmented, going back to how we set up, you know, all these incentives, um, we're, we're at this like, oh, it's inevitable that all this devastation is going to happen. Let's spend trillions of dollars on the little cure. So that that's just where I have a lot of like sympathy for folks. I just think like there's just so much slanted against us right now. A lower income family can't afford healthy food. Um, and, and, you know, their kids are getting obese and like, if there's this miracle cure, sure. I mean, like, like I, I kind of get it. And soda is available on welfare. Right. So it's such a cyclical issue, but there, there are free resources like podcasts like this and other podcasts where you can get the information you need. Um, I'm going to, I want to have you back on because I only got through like a quarter of my questions (laughs) and your email was so thorough. What, what would you like to say to the listeners before we go? Um, What is a takeaway for you? I know we talked a lot about individual empowerment and also breaking down some stigmas and, and presenting issues, systematic issues and issues with the implementation of pharmaceuticals into our healthcare system. What are a couple of takeaways that you'd like to say to our listeners, some things that they can work on right away that won't be break the bank and, and, can sort of make them feel empowered to st- start on the path of, of individual health and wellness. In my, my sister, Casey and I are writing a book um, on metabolic health on these issues and trying to put together the main tips, the main principles that have been a huge part of our journey and, and still, you know, really what I'm trying to prioritize for my son and for me. Um, it starts with food. It's the fuel of our bodies. And if you can check the label for sugar, canola oil, you know, oils like that, seed oils and processed grains, you're going to get 80% of the way there. And you're really going to see, I think, a reverse in not only mental, uh, mental issues and physical issues. I I really do think that's a core. Um, The other pillars, the other plates are movement, um, 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week uh, for three months is more effective than SSRI clinically in lowering depression. And that has really helped me think about exercise, which has always been a struggle for me, but it's not like a vain thing for me anymore. It's just moving the cells and subjecting ourselves to a little bit of stress has profound impacts on mental health. And there's clinical evidence of that. 
and you know the the brain body connection and i think i think movement is so uh important for that i think we've talked a lot about sleep and there's been a lot of podcasts a lot of things on sleep but it is a foundation and i think you know for our kids up until our adults i think a lot of us have had i had very bad sleep habits as a child mm -hmm. and that really does follow you and i think it is crazy uh, now that I'm a little bit more attuned to this, how some bad sleep affects your mood, affects really how you show up to a lot of other people in the world. I think that's a big one. But I, and I, the last is chronic stress. And and I, and this is a little bit of a bank shot. Um, and this is a powerful substance, but like, this is one tactic, but I, I do, I am very passionate when you ask for large scale solutions on how we get out of this mess. Um, substances and practices and habits that can produce more awe and curiosity about the world. I, I think a big renaissance that's hopefully going to happen soon is is psychedelics i think it is an absolute moral travesty that we stigmatize those compounds um it that my experience after my mom died um and uh, my previous company was struggling and a lot of like just stress around covid uh, my experience on on psilocybin uh very introspective high dose kind of thinking about the impact i want to have in the world like led me on this journey to speak out about this and like devote my life to this and um, I just think it's a big thing we're missing. And I think uh, part of the holistic picture, but, but that led me to you know, have much more appreciation for meditation. And just as you've talked about these daily habits to, to try to tap into a little bit more of transcendence and connectivity with the world. I really do think like being conscious and deliberate about that is a key uh, to the, to the picture. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, if, if you're, if this, you're on this journey, a listener's on this journey and, um, and uh, you know, wants to learn more. I, I just think it's going rabbit holes on this content in the podcast. I think we have better than a Stanford medical school education, as my sister says on the, on podcasts, on books by Fuck, yeah. Mark Hyman. And yeah. And, and I just, I just think um, that curiosity, again, it's the indelible image. My mom, it was too late for her, but just the act, the fact that she had all these books, the fact that she was listening to podcasts that lives with, with us now. And it's just like, that that'll have impacts if you're living a life of curiosity. So that, that's a big thing for me. It's just continuing to consume this content, but. And living a life my, of curiosity. Uh, I love that. That might have to yeah. be the title of the podcast. Where, <laughs> where can my fans support you? Where can they find resources? This will also be included in the show notes, but let them know where they can find you and, and also uh, information about true med. <laughs> Yeah. So TrueMed is my answer to this question. So how do we change incentives? So real quickly, what, what we're doing with my new company, TrueMed, is we're issuing prescriptions, doctor's notes for food and exercise and sleep. And actually, this is what the IRS requires. But if you have a prescription for food, you can actually buy food as medicine. You can buy it with your tax-free HSA or FSA accounts, you know, save 30, 40 percent. So it's it's our effort to kind of push policy in that direction. There's $150 billion right now sitting in HSA, FSA accounts. You know, generally that's a slush fund for once you get sick for drugs. You can use that right now, you know, for a family can spend $7,200 on tax-free money um, on food. So um, that's on my Twitter, Callie Means. You've got links to TrueMed. We're going to be launching that soon. Um, and I'm talking a lot about these issues but yeah, we're trying to build a community of people that want to put food in these habits you talk about um, at the center of medicine. And, and, and we're not a big part of this. And what we're doing with TrueMed, what I'm talking about, is we've got to change those incentives. We've got to, we've got to spend more money on food, less money on drugs, um, really, at the end of the day. And, um, and that's kind of the battle we're on. So, so TrueMed.com and my, uh, my Twitter, Callie Means, is where you can find me. You heard it, guys, from his lips to God's yeah. ears. More <laughs> money on food. And less on, on drugs, unless it's psilocybin or marijuana. <laughs> Those are root cause. Those are, that's a nut. That's next, next time. We'll That'll be the next I, episode. I have a theory on that, but. <laughs> I want to talk about psilocybin and health with you on the next episode. This has been so enlightening, the quickest hour I've ever had. And I'm so glad that I've met you and that I can share your story. Like I said, you guys, there will be more information in the show notes as to how you can find Callie and information about TrueMed. And obviously we're going to be looking out for that book. Thank you so much for your time, your information, your resources, your energy, your spirit. Thank you and for your, your energy. It comes through so much and I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs>